hit record. Thank you. So this will be recorded, um, as you've probably just seen. Um, but welcome everyone to supporting and understanding the behavioral health needs of our Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander service members, veterans, and their families. Next slide, please. Um, to get us started, um, we're going to be having a federal welcome from our partner, Stacy Owens. Uh, Stacy, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Chantel. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Stacy Owens, Military and Veterans Affairs Liaison for SAMHSA. And in honor of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Heritage Month, we're so pleased to partner with our um, SMVFTA Center to bring, to bring you this call on supporting the behavioral health needs of SMVF, who are AANHPI. Um, we know that this community is culturally and linguistically diverse, and we also know that there are commonalities like traditions of leadership, uh, resilience, and courage, and we're so happy to have this great group of subject matter experts who are AANHPI veterans themselves, as well as advocates for the SMVF community. Uh, we appreciate all four of them being here to teach us about best, best practices to support the community. And we also thank all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules to learn more about this important topic. So I will turn it back over to you, Chantel. Thanks again. Please. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so my name, for some, some of you may already know it, uh, is Chantel Boudreau. I'm a project associate with SAMHSA's SMVFTA Center, um, and I'm gonna be moderating today's call. Next one, please. Um, so just a disclaimer really quick. The views, opinions, and content expressed in this presentation do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of SAMHSA, HHS, or VHA. Um, or the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go over some housekeeping really quickly, um, and then we're gonna do participant introductions, have our presentations from our four wonderful presenters, um, have opportunity for Q&A, and then we'll do some next steps and adjourn. Next slide. So for the housekeeping, um, whenever you uh, ask a question, please identify yourself, whether it's in the chat or um, if you're speaking out loud. Um, when you do raise your hand, if that's the way you wish to speak, please wait to be called on. Um, you can also ask questions in the chat, as I mentioned previously. Um, please make sure that you are muted, whether it's your computer speaker or your phone speaker. Um, and please be respectful and keep others in mind. Next slide, please. So for participant introductions, um, we have a lot of people here today. So for time, we ask that you please introduce yourself in the chat. Please give your name, title, agency, and then if you're representing a governor's challenge team, a mayor's challenge team, a crisis intercepting mapping team, we want to know. And if you're not, that's fine. Welcome. Um, please put your state or territory in the chat so that we know where you're coming from. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and so the moment of truth, I am introducing the presenters for today. Um, so I'm just gonna read a very abridged version of their bios, um, cause I know we want to get to hear all the content from them. Um, but so Amy, Amy L, Amy's father is a refugee and her mother is an immigrant. She enlisted into the army right after high school and served for four years on active duty with the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood, Texas. Ms. Al was elected to be the first female commander at the Boston Chinatown American Legion Post in June, 2015. In 2019, Ms. Al was selected as the transitional patient advocate in the post 9-11 military to VAMC program. This unique role allows her to interact with service members and their loved ones transitioning from the military back into the civilian community. Um, our next presenter, Roy Gamboa, um, he's the vice president of Got Your 671, which is a nonprofit veteran organization on the island of Guam. 
uh, GY671 is dedicated to helping veterans in Guam regain self-confidence, develop a strong support system, and improve their overall well-being, both mentally and physically. GY671 is the lead partner on Guam for the Together with Veterans program, which enlists rural veterans and community partners. Mr. Gamboa is a lifetime member of the, of the VFW, 3rd Marine Corps Division Association, Guam chapter, and is the local coordinator for the Irrevent Warriors Organization and works on numerous projects with other veterans and nonprofit organizations. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our third presenter, Matt Sito, he's a Marine Corps veteran from Boston, Massachusetts. He served from 2001 to 2005 with Marine Fighter Attack Squadron 323 and supported Operation Southern Watch and Operation Iraqi Freedom as an aviation maintenance administration specialist slash data analyst. Mr. Sito is a is a past commander for the local American Re Legion post in Boston's Chinatown. In 2018, he partnered with the Chinese American Citizen Alliance in Walking Capitol Hill to advocate for the passage of the Chinese American World War II Veteran Congressional Gold Medal Act to recognize the more than 20,000 Chinese American World War II veterans. The bill, the bill was signed by the president in 2018. In 2019, he partnered with the local chapter of the Chinese American Citizen Alliance and co-organizing the New England Regional Ceremony for the Congressional Gold Medal. And then last but not least, uh, Rain Kapiko is a Native Hawaiian veteran who served in the United States Navy as a surface warfare officer. Upon discharge, Mr. Kapiko recognized the difficulties of the veteran communities firsthand. Um, Issues included awareness of VA entities and processes, employment, homelessness, substance use, post-traumatic stress disorder, separation adjustment, coping, and anxiety. He's an active veteran advocate within the Native Hawaiian community, increasing legislative awareness on both the state and federal levels and helping bring light to issues within the veteran community. He started the first ever veteran column in a Native Hawaiian newspaper, allowing for a voice to reach out to Native veterans, Native Hawaiian veterans and their families. So as you can see, we have a lot um, coming from all of our presenters. So I'm really, really excited about this. I know we're going to learn so much. Um, but uh, to kick us off for the call, we have Matt Sito. So uh, if we can get the next slide. And then Matt, the floor is yours. Um, thank you, Chantel. Um... First of all, thank you uh, for uh, having me here. Uh, first, I want to tell, say that I'm not a subject matter expert. Uh, I just have a, a love and passion to learn about um, you know, history of Asian Americans that are serving in the military that have contributed, being that I am also a Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I come from Boston, Massachusetts. I have, uh, my, I have cousins that are in the Marines. I have an uncle that's a Vietnam War veteran, and also my great-grandfather served as well. And so this is just very important um, just to bring highlights uh, in stories and experiences of Asian Americans in the military. So um, first slide is talks a little bit about the background about Asian Americans in the US military. Uh, as, as we all know, Asian Americans are very diverse. And so there's many different groups uh, that have migrated over to the United States, you know, throughout American history. Um, and, and so, you know, I just wanted to highlight some of the, you know, past uh, uh, representations throughout time. Um, so first, you know, you know, to really talk about, you know, the first, you know, Asian Americans that have come to this country were the Filipinos. Uh, Filipinos, you know, who first settled in New Orleans in 1763, uh, participated in the Battle of 1812 uh, as part of the Battle of New Orleans in 1815. And that was the first really record of Asian Americans serving in the US military in the early 1800s. Um, and then during the Civil War, there were also records of Filipino Americans and Chinese Americans and Indian Americans that served as part of the Union and the Confederacy. So it was documented about, I think about 100 to 200 um, Asian Americans that served. Uh, and then World War II was where it's the most significant uh, an estimated of, of 33,000 Japanese Americans served, uh, about more than 20,000 Chinese Americans served, and more than 260,000 Filipino and Filipino Americans uh, served during World War II. 
Uh, and according to the VA, there are 264,000 Asian Americans and 27,000 Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander veterans that serve uh, our veterans, identify as veterans. Uh, holding on to this page, uh, as I read some of these bullet points, you know, I want to recognize the importance of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders that's that have served, um, you know, throughout military history, because much of this is not documented in American history books. You know, we don't really hear about, oh, there were, you know, Chinese Americans that served in the Civil War. There is a story of a gentleman, a uh, Chinese American, I believe the name of Edward uh, De Cajota. Um, too bad I did not have a slide for him, but he came on board a ship uh, to the United States when he was a kid and he served during the Civil War. Uh, and unfortunately, he could not become a U.S. citizen uh, because of the laws during that time that prevented him from becoming getting citizenship. So that's very important to recognize that, you know, even though they were Asian Americans that served, um, a lot of them were not able to uh, become and assimilate into the American you know, U.S. society. Uh, next slide, please. You know, on to talking about, you know, continuous service is, uh, you know, what happens for many Asian Americans after they, they served in the military. Uh, you know, men, much like other veterans in, in this country, you know, a lot of us, you know, want to continue with that service, you know, through veterans organizations. Uh, many of the veteran organizations, as you know, the American Legion, the uh, Disabled American Veterans, the Veterans for Foreign Wars, Many of them were started in the early 1900s. Um, many Asian Americans, um, specifically Chinese Americans, uh, from what I understand and know, were discriminated against when they tried to join local American Legion posts. Um, the oldest Chinese American post in San Francisco is the American Legion Cafe Post 384, uh, which is made of predominantly Chinese American veterans, founded in 1931 by World War I and World War II veterans. Uh, a lot of them could not join other American Legion posts during that time. And hence, a lot of them, that's why they chartered their own post, um, not just in San Francisco, but many um, large Chinese American towns, Chinatowns across the country, such as Boston and New York and Chicago and, and Hawaii and Philadelphia and everywhere uh, because of that discrimination, uh, because they couldn't become a part of, you know, mainstream American Legions and also VFWs and so forth. So it sprouted across the country, not just in Chinatowns, but also literally Tokyo's, Japan towns, uh, and Filipino and Manila towns across the country. They created these many of these veterans organizations that catered predominantly for those ethnic groups um, that could not have you know, otherwise joined you know, other veterans groups and received the services that they were um, eligible for. Um, uh, next slide. Uh, this next slide is also very important to me, and it's also a reason why, why uh, you know, what I do is very important. Um, you know, I really believe in um, educating the public about, you know, the AAPI service, you know, to, to the United States. Uh, it's important to recognize and, and understand their, their contributions. And I really wanted to highlight uh, three important events that really recognize um, you know, AAPI service, specifically during World War II. So in, in 2011, um, I think an initiative that was headed by the uh, many of the local Japanese veterans organizations, uh, former Secretary of Veterans Affairs, uh, uh, General Shiseki, Eric Shiseki, also endorsed this uh, campaign to um, recognize the 33,000 Nisei veterans of Japanese descent of World War II. Many of you know of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, uh, which is considered the most decorated unit for its size and shape during World War II. Um, you know, and, and many of their families were interned, you know, uh, during the, in the internment camps across the United States. Despite of that, they still served. Many of them paid the ultimate sacrifice. Um, and finally, in 2011, they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal, which is the highest recognition uh, award bestowed by Congress, which is very important uh, because during that time, you know, 
uh, you know, th there were still a lot of things going on uh, in terms of how our country was, you know, acted and reacted towards Asian Americans. And then in 2007, 2017, uh, Filipinos uh, veterans were also being recognized, a campaign that was headed by uh, a, a General Tony Taguba of the United States Army, you know, really believed that, you know, we needed to recognize the importance of Filipino and Filipino American veterans contributions, the more than 260,000 Filipinos that served during World War II. Uh, during World War II, the Philippines was a, uh, a colony, a territory of the United States. And during that time, Congress promised them, promised Filipinos that if they served, that they would be have access to veteran benefits, U.S. veteran benefits, and citizenship. But unfortunately, after the service, after the World War II ended in 1946, uh, Congress passed the Rescission Act, which revoked veteran benefits and payments to Filipino soldiers and denied them U.S. citizenship. So almost 60, 70 years later, you know, these Filipino veterans are, are finally being recognized for their service and another campaign happened where called the, I believe the uh, uh, Filipino uh, Education Act uh, that fought for Filipino veterans benefits. And some of them, I think about 10,000 of them were finally recognized and were given uh, veteran benefits. In 2020, uh, which I was a part of that campaign uh, in 2018, I was able to work with the Chinese American Citizens Alliance, uh, which is a civics organization that decided to create this initiative where, wow, there were more than 20,000 Chinese American veterans that served, but none of them were really recognized. During the World War II, there were the population of Chinese and Chinese Americans was about 100,000 across the country. Uh, and only in about 20,000 plus served during that time. So that's about 20, more than 20% of the Chinese American population that served. And another little tidbit, about 40% of that population that served were non-citizens, were non-US citizens. And the reason because of that, they were non-US citizens was because of the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a law that was put in place by the United States that was enacted in 1882 that said that Chinese cannot come to this country and the Chinese are here that cannot be US citizens. And so many of the Chinese, which as you see in the picture, uh, it's me holding the, one of the medals that I accepted on behalf of my great grandfather um, who came to this country um, and was not a US citizen, my great grandfather, and who kind of, you can say came undocumented, but still served and wore the United States uniform despite the discrimination of this country and what they had to go through um, uh, despite, of, despite of that. And so, you know, I wanna highlight this, you know, these three important groups um, and many other groups that have really you know, contributed to, you know, to this, you know, this great nation, but also, you know, experience a lot of discrimination and prejudice. And, and still, despite of that, went on to, you know, serve their nation, continue to serve in the American legions and veterans organizations in their communities, and, and still become, you know, uh, uh, great citizens of this country. Uh, next slide, please. So public awareness. Um, so this slide is really to talk about, you know, what, you know, the A, you know, uh, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community is very diverse. Um, there's, you can't pinpoint one issue towards a whole group. Um, you know, there's a history of colonization, migration and racism that affected these communities to build their own communities and resources. You know, hence that's why there were Chinatowns across country across the countries, because we were not Chinese American communities were not exactly welcomed outside of their Chinatown communities. Um, history of migration, as I talked about, 
you know, it was documented that Filipinos, you know, came to this country, settled in New Orleans in the, in the 1800s. And then Chinese, large migrations of Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans in the mid 1800s. So a lot of them came at different times that have brought histories and experiences and experiences themselves that, you know, change the dynamics of, you know, their story in their communities. We are still fighting stereotypes. Uh, many of our experiences counter many microaggressions and a need for assimilation. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, I speak from my own experience. Um, you know, when I served, you know, I still experience little small microaggressions where, you know, I was told that I'm a Chinaman, you know. My friend who was also in the Marines, who was of Vietnamese descent, um, one told me a story where his drill instructor, you know, told him like, oh, what are you going to do after this tra training? Are you going to go back to, you know, train your VC comrades, your Viet Cong comrades? So, you know, those type of remarks, you know, are still, you know, within, you know, many of Asian Americans that are still serving, you know, their experiences and stories, even despite, you know, their service and what did they have to prove that they are Americans. Um, mental health stigma, you know, within the Asian American community, uh, and I know Amy is probably going to talk a little more about that, you know, there's a lack of communication on the importance of mental health and the need for resources, you know, um, you know, within the Asian American culture, you know, we don't really talk about mental health, we don't, um, you know, share, you know, about things about, you know, that are personal, um, that are, um, because, anything related to mental health is considered, you know, quote unquote, you know, crazy. Um, that is, you know, not of the norm. And so, you know, if, you know, families talk about mental health, it's somewhat shunned upon and not necessarily, you know, welcomed. And so when there's a lack of communication there, there's also a lack of resources also. There's also a generational gap. Um, as I talk about culture within the Asian American community, there's also a large generational gap. Um, I'm a second generation Chinese American. However, you know, I mean, being born here, my parents, you know, came to this country, you know, even at a young age to this country, still, there's still a generational gap, a, a difference in understanding, especially in the mental health area. Um, for someone who've, you know, been deployed, um, to, you know, OEF and OIF, uh, you know, during the beginning of the Iraqi war, you know, coming back, um, it was hard to kind of share stories, you know, to my family or whatnot, or my experiences in the military, um, because of the cultural gap, because of the generational gap. Um, but even among, you know, fellow, you know, veterans of, who are older age, you know, now that I'm in the American Legion, um, I have, uh, you know, veterans who are from World War II and in Korean War, you know, have their own experiences that are different from mine. And so, you know, they have their own stories, you know, and I have mine, you know, which are very different um, and still has, you know, a lot to understand. And so, um, so, you know, these are some of the things that I wanted to point out, you know, a little background, a little history. Uh, but also importance of recognition of service, but also being aware of, you know, the different histories and stories of within our communities uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the resources that, that we share and also don't share. So um, thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you very much. I think we can uh, move on to the next slide. And we're going to, uh, if anyone has questions, feel free to put those in the chat and we'll make sure that um, we have time um, for those as well. So next is Amy. Hi. Um, so I'm Amy Ow. I'm a second generation. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. Next slide, please. So my why, my brief background. So I am a role model to all the first and second generation kids trying to find their way. Um, I also wanted the Asian American community to know that there are U.S. veterans in their community. 
I, um, I also wanted the average North Americans to know that there are Asian Americans that serve in the military too, because I feel like that's not really why I known. I also have the privilege of being born as an American and not taking any of my rights or freedoms for granted. I'm the 1% that has volunteered to serve my nation. I belong here, even though I am viewed and at times treated like I did not belong here. This is what keeps me going to ensure the next generation will have an easier time than I have. I also continue to seek ways to relate to my federal, fellow veterans in my personal and professional life. So I'm involved in um, the American Legion, Boston Chinatown, to be with the Chinatown community um, for veteran and community support and issues. And in my professional life, I've chosen to become a social worker and I have the privilege of working as a social worker in the VA um, with fellow veterans from age 20-ish to 100, 100 plus. So I feel very blessed and I'm lucky that I get to do that. Um, next slide, please. So the second generation perspective, um, like as Chantel has introduced, um, my dad's a refugee. He came here in the United States um, around the 1970s. And in, in speaking history, like what Matt was saying, I know in 1960s um, with the civil rights era and um, the where they changed some of the immigration acts where they allowed um, more people to come into the United States. That's when they lifted the Chinese Exclusion Act, you know, the quotas and all that stuff. So my dad was able, he... I feel like this is an important story to share uh, about my own family's history. He escaped mainland China from the Guangzhou region. He swam and, and hiked and, and did all that through, and he swam through shark infested waters to get to Hong Kong Island. And then from there, he was able to get sponsored by a church from New York to pay for his plane ticket and to sponsor him to come to the United States. Without that, I wouldn't be here um, to, uh, to kind of like full, in a way, I feel like it's a full circle. Like I was able to serve my country where this country gave an opportunity to my dad to um, have a, a different experience and um, a different future for their children. Um, and then he went back later and met my mom and they married within a month. And then uh, she talked about a self-arranged marriage. So then, so then they came to the, so they came to the United States and had me and my four sisters. So I was actually the firstborn in the U.S. from my mom and my dad's side. So I had to grow up fast. You know, I was uh, the um, interpreter, navigator of systems, local, state, federal government, meaning um, for uh, benefits like either if it was uh, field assistance or um, SNAP benefits or helping my parents um, enrolled in different programs to being interpreters for my siblings or in school. So we kind of um, talking about the generational um, hardships, you know, for, you know, I'm supposed to be a kid, but now I'm, I'm doing an adult role for my parents. So, but I didn't have the privilege of the gap year, you know, like, I, and I'm just, generalizing right of the typical American culture you know like saying that teenagers have a gap year from high school to college to find yourself or to figure things out there, there was no such thing in my family it was either you get a job or go to college what are you going to do you got to do something you can't just be hanging out um so and I feel like my parents pushed that so we wouldn't have the hard type of work that they had to do when they arrived here due to their limited English or limited um, credentials that people were looking for. So I chose the military to escape, <laughs> to escape um, just the stress from my parents, uh, the cultural demands from my um, family. And, and it was also a way for me to set myself up for success post-military. I grew up very low income, very poor. Um, it didn't feel like it, but looking back now, I know it, it, we were. Um, so I knew there was no way that my family would be able to help me pay for college or, um, or even secondary training or schools or anything like that. So I, I knew that was an opportunity for me. So I was always 
and still sometimes I feel like this continue. Um, I'm in a space of in between. I'm not fitting in anywhere outside the home. Um, I, there was American culture, you know, like all my friends are like, oh, we're going to the movies. We're going to go hang out. But I had to go home and take care of my sisters um, growing up. And at home, we had to speak Cantonese, no English. Um, and I think that's a way for my parents to make sure we keep our culture. And also for, for themselves, they didn't really speak English. So make sure they had ways to communicate with their children. So I enlisted in the active army when I was 17 years old. My parents allowed me to take the ASVAB test and go through the intake process. I am and was still the only person in my immediate and extended family in the United States that have served in the US Armed Forces. Next slide, please. So my active duty um, veteran um, female exper experience perspective um, coming from my short time in active service. So East Asian culture, particularly Chinese culture, it mimics the hierarchy of the military structure. Everyone knows their pecking order. Everyone knows their role, the role of your, um, your rank, enlisted officer. You do not speak until you're spoken to. And being a Chinese American or a Chinese female, um, grow, growing up in a very uh, a male dominant culture, there wasn't, you know, I didn't really get to express my mind growing up or say much um, or anything like that. Uh, my dad always had the final say. So, but thankfully it wasn't like that in the military. You know, I still had a voice, um, but it was depending on how, how much I can use that voice depending on my rank while I was in the service. So, I mean, I still had, um, it wasn't as suffocating, I guess. Um, maybe that's not a group word, but that's what it felt like growing up in my household. So, like I said earlier, I, didn't, I felt like I didn't belong anywhere. So even being in the military, I didn't feel like I belong. Um, I was a minority within a minority, being Asian female, Chinese American on active duty um, and being in a transportation unit. I was a truck driver, that was my job. So I stuck out even more. You didn't see a lot of us, um, I guess Chinese females being truck drivers, you know, in the military. So, um, so there was racism while on active duty, microaggression, such as where are you from, questions, oh, you speak English so well. Oh, you're from Boston? No, no, no. Where are you? Re where are you from? Where are you from? I'm like from Boston. You know, you know, it's just questions like that. You know, where were you born? You know, I'm like Boston. Still wasn't satisfied, right? They're just trying to find a, a pigeonhole where I belong. So that stuck out. That came from my superiors to en enlisted. You know, that microaggression, that experience, and I had things. I was called chink, gook, Viet Cong from. Um, fellow soldiers, um, random, you know, people on posts, um, things like that. And I also experienced sexism and um, military sexual trauma. And that military sexual trauma, it's a big umbrella from sexual harassment to um, um, rape. Um, but I experienced like unwanted touching, groping, um, daily sexual innuendos from peers and superiors. So that happened. And this was like the early 2000s. So I'm saying it's not that long ago. Um, that, and, and I know in the recent news, there's um, maybe not like Fort Hood. That's where I was stationed at. All the, all the sexual harassment, um, things, cover up stories. Um, and if you talk to other people that served in Fort Hood be, before my time, until now, that's still happening. So it's not um, it's not uncommon, but you do feel really isolated. Like I didn't have a lot of um, people or peers that I can look up to. I didn't really see a lot of um, higher ranking Asian um, male or female in the service that I can feel safe to go to and talk to about these things. Um, so that was just a small glimpse of my service and of that that I experienced, but there were good things too. You know, I made a lot of good friends, um, lifelong friends in, in my service. So I don't want to paint it like it was such, it was all negative. So there was some, there was good experience too. I wanted to also um, share that. Um, next slide, please. So this is another topic that I feel is important um, in the Asian American community. At least I can talk about it in the community that I live in and what I see. Um, so gambling addiction is a problem in the Asian American community. And I think this goes back to what Matt was mentioning earlier about lack of mental health support or stigma of getting mental health support. 
Um, so gambling, it lights up the same pathways as cocaine does in your brain. So it releases dopamine, dopamine, you have a rush of feeling good for a little while. And then you all, the person that experienced that always tries to chase that high. So in my experience, um, there's a lack of community spaces in Boston Chinatown. And what I mean by that, it's unless you're in a family association or um, belong to the YMCA or, or something like that, right? You don't really have a place to go because every because real estate is so valuable. Everything is either a restaurant or um, a business of some sort. There's every corner now, there's like a bubble tea shop in Boston Chinatown if you visit. But um, so is it, those, those type of things. There's not really like a, um, a community space to really go to. And, and a lot of it is time constraints. So the immigrants or refugees um, from my dad's cohort to even the ones that are coming in now, they're working menial professional professions like janitor or working at restaurants or cleaning or hotel work. Um, so they have a lot, a lot of time. I can say for myself growing up, my parents worked 364 days out of the year. The only day they got off was Thanksgiving because they worked in the, um, a Chinese takeout um, restaurant that's the, the least busiest day for them. So that's the day they close. So it's only only time I had my both sets of my parents at home with all of us one day out of the year. So that's what there's like a lot of time constraints. Um, and they um, for my family. So gambling is a social activity. You know, there's a at least pre COVID there was buses leaving Chinatown and um, surrounding communities in Boston where they'll give you a voucher to get a meal, um, give you a match play to go gamble. You have the bus ride, like two hours to go to Connecticut. You can sit in the bus and chat with other people and then come back and chat with other people. So it was a means of escape, um, a social activity. And I think it speaks to the gambling is acceptable, right? But going to go see a therapist or going to get mental health um, is not acceptable or a lot of shame um, trying to get help that way. Um, so I think there's part of that as well. So thank you for letting me um, speak, um, sharing what my experience um, in the military and my community and being second generation Chinese American. Um, thank you. Thank you, Amy, and thank you for sharing your story and also that insight on the gambling. Um, I think that's something important to know for people working um, with Asian American communities that that could be um, an area to maybe focus on. So thank you very much. Uh, with that, I'm going to move us on to our next presenter, Roy. Hey, good morning, Chantel. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see there, I think I filled up the entire red bar. I spent some time with the reserves, Guam Army National Guard and United States Marine Corps. Needless to say, I couldn't keep still. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of a rundown of, of uh, some of the things that I had, uh, the branches of service that I've served with, and then my veteran life after that, uh, VFW, Disabled American Vets. And uh, since 2019, I've been the Vice President of Got Your 671. Next slide, please. Uh, some of the quick facts about Guam, and before I jump into that, I'm gonna say, hey, you know, Matt and Amy, um, I couldn't help but recognize that there's just a lot of similarities uh, with our cultures, Asian American, things like that. Matt, I mentioned, or I side barred, uh, side chatted with you. Uh, yes, there are Guamanians that have uh, that are have been on record of serving as far back as the Civil War as well. Uh, the most difficult thing is when a lot of the uh, the Guamanians left Guam on military whaling. I mean, not military, but on whaling ships. They ended up in Boston. And to assimilate into the culture, a lot of their names were changed. Uh, interestingly enough, there is a record of a Benjamin Button. If you've seen the movie, there is a Benjamin Button with his record of home, uh, home of record being Guam. So uh, we'll chat more on that. Uh, some of the fast facts about Guam and where I'm from. Uh, like I said, good morning, everybody. It's the future. It is 510 uh, tomorrow for most of you guys. Uh, and in the, in the few, next few slides, you'll see exactly how far off Guam is uh, from the U.S. mainland. 
Um, Guam re remains a strategic, uh, I'm just going to say it's a, a strategic military outpost uh, for the U.S. military. Uh, we would be the first line of defense for threats coming to us from the far Asian regions, you know, the, the little dude up in North Korea. Um, Guam is home to 16,400 military dependents and soon to be 4,000 plus Marines uh, and their family members making their way to Guam. Uh, for, I'm going to say, close to 20 years, uh, Guam has maintained the highest enlistment rate. Uh, Amy sounds very familiar. We wanted to get away from our very strict parents <laughs> in some instances. And so at 17, just like you, raised our right hand and said, all right, I'm off. Uh, here on Guam, we have a major challenge, and Amy touched a little bit on it as well. Matt, um, it's doing some research. I think it has a lot to do with pride. Uh, 30,000 plus veterans and only about 8,000 are recognized by the Department of Veterans Affairs, severely underserved uh, with the hospitals and clinics and things like that. Um, and in the most recent wars to, from uh, OIF, OEF, uh, more than 20,000 of the residents of Guam have uh, deployed in those operations. Next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna jump right into it. I'm, I'm typically straight down to business type stuff. I'll talk a little bit more about myself in the, few, uh, in the next few slides. Some of the biggest concerns that we have out here on the island of Guam, uh, the mental health treatment centers, uh, there is none, there is no inpatient treatment. Right now we've got soldiers, sailors, Marines that actually have to fly out to Hawaii and spend months on end to go through the PRRP programs. Uh, there is nothing existing here in Guam. Uh, when I put down revolving door, um, every couple of years, uh, there seems to be a rotation of uh, mental health care providers and so, it's, you can imagine what it's like going through that system, uh, receiving some treatment, things start to improve, and then you receive a new uh, therapist. Uh, and then you peel that scab and you have to explain your entire story all over again. Uh, the primary care providers, uh, they too as well have a revol revolving door issue. Um, it is not easy to, to, to make a living here on the island of Guam. Things are expensive. We have to get everything shipped in. So cost of living is high. Um, and it just makes it very difficult when veterans are expecting to change their primary care doctor every couple of years. Um, I know the VA system is working on improving uh, the facilities out here. I believe they're expanding the CBOC. Um, but however, even during the groundbreaking, it was already identified that the, the clinic outside the uh, Guam Naval Hospital, the U.S. Naval Hospital, uh, just wasn't going to cut it for the many number of veterans that are out here. Uh, we get our prescription medications mailed in to us from Hawaii. Uh, so you can imagine if, if uh, some veterans are losing track of uh, the pills that they have, if they don't go into the system to reorder their medication, we could go days or even weeks um, without medication. Uh, it used to be where veterans and retirees would be able to just access the U.S. Naval Hospital base and just pick up our prescriptions there. So hopefully some of those things are start to get, get addressed by the, uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs. Next slide, please. Uh, again, more of the concerns that we have out here, uh, you'd think on a small island it would be very difficult to find homeless veterans. Uh, unfortunately, they are out there. Um, the last uh, point in time count that our community uh, was involved with just before the uh, pandemic identified 40 uh, veterans living out on the streets. And of course, that's not identifying many of the veterans that are living in substandard housing or couch surfing, so to speak. Um, the shelters, the homeless shelters out here, unfortunately, are, are usually filled by um, families and, and uh, in some cases, even there, there are children in these homeless shelters. I know the uh, government has taken great strides. Uh, they recently just uh, procured an additional homeless shelter uh, here on the island of Guam to house another um, 150 to 250 individuals. Uh, veterans have unique needs, so a lot of times they avoid going into those types of shelters. Um, Guam, at this moment, uh, the VA system falls under uh, Hawaii. I believe the budget is handled and controlled by Hawaii. Uh, so a lot of things have to get approved. Referrals and all that stuff have to, has to be sent out uh, to Hawaii for, for approval. And this can take days, weeks, uh, and in some cases, even months. I know 
There are signs of improvement. However, these are some of the issues that have been plaguing our island veterans for, for many, many, many years. Uh, and in the next uh, slide or so, I'll show you exactly why uh, that is a challenge. One of the things that we are hoping for here on the island is, is uh, if we can't have a hospital, at least double the size of the CBOC uh, to help provide more uh, care uh, as far as mental care, mental health care and uh, primary care for our veterans. Next slide, please. Um, the little map there on the side would just show you exactly how far Guam is uh, just to Hawaii and to the West Coast. And you see how close in vicinity we are to the Philippines, Taiwan, um, and then Australia. There are many questions. I know, Chantel, you've been out here at least once or twice. Uh, I'm pretty sure when you landed, everybody, or before you even came out here, everybody was like, Guam, where the heck is Guam? Is that near Guatemala? And I'm like, yes, in the dictionary, it's near Guatemala. That's as close as, as Guatemala is going to get to Guam. <laughs> so... Uh, some of the challenges, I think, you know, it, it sounds like I'm complaining out here on the island of Guam, but I can see my brothers and sisters also in the uh, in Saipan, our neighboring island to the north, uh, the Federated States of Micronesia, Palau. Uh, they're all spread throughout the uh, the ocean area below, just below Guam. Uh, there is no CBOC out there. There are no mental health treatment facilities out there. Uh, those veterans have to travel to Guam, and in some cases, out to Hawaii and the U.S. mainland. So uh, you can see the number of changes. Just uh, the last time the VA flew me out to Hawaii, the round trip ticket was $2,800. Uh, that didn't include room and board when I was out in Hawaii. Uh, and one of the biggest gripes, I believe, if you're from the territory is, yes, we can go serve, raise our right hand, take a bullet, but we can't vote for our president. Hopefully someday somebody's gonna scream loud enough and make that happen. <laughs> Sweet, next slide, please. Uh, I'll go into what we've been doing, um, got your 671, uh, even prior to that, one of my uh, cousins who served with the, uh, with the Army National Guard deployed to OEF on a couple of occasions, uh, we recognized each other, the services that we had done, and found that the only person, the only people that could understand us were veterans that, were, that had similar experiences. And we had helped each other, each other throughout the years um, in really bad times, really dark times. And, uh, and having a discussion one evening, we said, look, there's got to be a lot more veterans out there that are going through the same thing that we're going through. And uh, we decided to just you know, put our heads together, uh, create, the, uh, create a nonprofit organization. We brought in uh, or we had our initial meeting with other veterans women veterans, different branches, and what was supposed to be a one hour meeting turned into a three hour, um, what Marines call sweating from the eyes uh, fest. Uh, lots of stories that were shared, a lot of similarities and a lot of pains that most of us thought we were the only ones going through it uh, alone. And we recognized, right, we realized right away that no, we're not alone. We have very similar stories and we need to bring people together uh, to share those stories. Uh, we can't just live in that darkness, that shadow, so to speak. Um, Chantel talked about our mission, and we we see there's a need for our organization because there's a lot of veterans that uh, go through the VA system or seek help from uh, grant providers that have so many federal requirements in order to qualify. And in our books, you raised your right hand, you need help, we'll find ways to help you out. Um, we've done this by doing um, basic needs drives, veterans that are homeless, getting tents, um, bringing them into shelters. We had a gentleman, a uh, homeless veteran out here from Florida who had been trying to get back to the Philippines. He was out here with a check from the uh, Salvation Army. Banks didn't recognize the check. Long story short, we finally got him into a uh, little hotel motel. Um, we are changing his... his uh, uh, we are finding somebody locally to manage his 100% his, uh, dis, uh, disability compensation to manage his money for him um, and get him back on, back on his feet. And part of the reason he didn't qualify, and, and this is from the veteran himself, was he is a 100% disabled vet. And because he has that income coming in, he didn't meet certain criteria um, and he couldn't get some services. And we said, you know, sorry, excuse the language, screw that. We're going to help you out. Let's, and so... Uh, we spent the last week or so 
number one, keeping track of this gentleman. He would move from point place to place. And uh, as of two, three days ago, he's in a, he's in a lot better place. And that's some of the things that we do. Um, we don't just stop at the veterans. We work with family members because we recognize some of our spouses and kids that we had left uh, during deployments. They had to hold down the fort and they're just as important as our veterans. And so we have uh, some of the um, women veterans that are with us, their spouses join in our meetings. We have our discussions to kind of understand a little bit more about some of the issues that we're going through and why we do certain things when we're at home. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things that was started by a, a fellow Marine um, is something we call Battle Buddy Talk. And it's a weekly, uh, it's a weekly discussion uh, that initially started online where we would send out a Zoom link and we would tell everybody, hey, let's just come in, talk story. Um, and we would share ideas, we would share topics. And for me, that's taking place tonight. And uh, so a few days before the, uh, the Wednesday night meetings, uh, we'll, we'll share ideas and say, hey, look, the topic for this evening is, uh, for instance, you know, anger. Um, what are your triggers? How do you cope with it? And then we always, I personally try to make sure we close with uh, ways to um, provide tools uh, to the veterans and their family members on how to deal with, with certain things. Try to look at the positive uh, whenever we leave these meetings. Uh, and, and a lot of this was founded, um, again, with just veterans talking amongst each other because there is a sense of trust from other veterans knowing that we've been down the same path or similar paths uh, in, our, in our military history. And so we tend to trust each other. And um, in my visits to the therapist up at the CBOC, um, of course, at the end of my meeting, you know, Doc would say, hey, are, aren't you part of the GY671 group thing? And like, yes, I am. And she would say, you know, can't name any names, but there are quite a few veterans um, that have been discussing or sharing with them um, the battle buddy talk. And so she would thank us because uh, it makes it a lot easier for the veterans to open up to the therapists. And uh, a lot of the pushback that we would get from veterans is I'm not going to talk to him or her. Uh, they don't understand who we are. They're not veterans like, like, uh, like we are. So why would I want to do that? Why do I want to share? Why do I want to spill the beans? And with some of those very challenging veterans, we tell them, look, you don't necessarily have to do that, but you've got to take at least the tools. These guys are the experts. Use the tools that they're providing to you. They'll help. Whatever they share with you, share with us. Um, and what we can do is we can work on that. So we discuss everything in a group, and then we stick around for another hour or so just talking one-on-one -on -one with uh, people with very similar uh, experiences. Uh, we do have a preface saying, you know, look, we're not therapists. We're here basically just to discuss and uh, we do have social workers that show up. We have many people from all different walks of life come in and provide input. We've got active duty members that come out and seek help from us. And uh, we have the guardsmen that come out to uh, sit down and talk with us as well um, because they're fearful of going to the chaplain or fearful of seeking uh, psychological help while they're still wearing the uniform in fear that it's gonna hit their records. And with us, it's, look, man, you're just talking to, to a bunch of friends. Uh, you're talking to a bunch of um, veterans that have been where you're currently at, and you can talk to us. There's nothing recorded, uh, and we're just here to help you, uh, you know, get through those challenging days. Next slide, please. Uh, just a real quick snapshot of the community involvement, 5K uh, runs. We do hikes. Uh, the day before Memorial Day, we're going to be putting uh, our country's flag and, and our island's flag at the highest point um, in the world if you measure from the bottom of the Marianas Trench. <laughs> so we'll be hiking up there this Saturday uh, to replace a flag that was actually put up there uh, a few months ago by a YouTuber who uh, planted the flag by a geomarker indicating that that was the highest point um, from below sea level. And uh, following up a few months later, some other gentleman went up there and the, the flag was torn and tattered. Um, a friend of mine, oop, my camera just went out, okay. Okay, I'll keep speaking um, until I can figure out my camera. Um, anyways, we're placing the flag up there. We're going to bring something up. We're going to bring a metal flag and mount it to the, uh, the monument that's up there at the top of the hill. Uh, what we've done is we've worked with the Guam Veterans Commission, which is comprised of about 17 
uh, veteran organizations here on the island of Guam. And uh, we've been able to, as of at least 12 months ago, stop the bickering between all these veteran organizations and actually started to guide them towards a unified goal to, 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 to let the government know, hey, we make up a huge majority of the voting population on this island and you've got to listen to some of our issues and, and, and a lot of our concerns. Um, I believe a lot of elected officials, government officials have kind of just been scratching their heads only because they'll hear from one veteran organization saying, this is what we want, uh, this is what's important to us, and in another veteran organization will report something completely different. And so we're unifying that voice to make sure a lot of these uh, uh, government officials know, hey, these are our priorities and please focus on that. Uh, the last, top, the last item there is uh, Guam Economic Development Authority. We applied for a grant uh, a little over than a, a little more than half a year ago, and uh, the grant allowed us to purchase three tiny homes for homeless veterans. And uh, we were able to afford these three tiny homes with a very small budget because the purchase the, the home the, the company we purchased them from is a veteran-owned small business who was kind enough to give us a uh, basically. Um, 50% off on the purchase price of these tiny homes. And where we are going with this is for many years, numerous organizations have been promoting to the island of Guam, hey, we're gonna build this huge veterans community project with uh, pool and walking areas and multi-story buildings and, and yada, 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 multi-million dollar project. And that's been going on, that, that's been a discussion for 16 years at least. Um, that's like me trying to eat, basically everybody says, right, you're eating the elephant in one bite. What we're trying to do is we're going the uh, on the ground approach. Let's start with these three tiny homes. We have already been invited back to the uh, Gita grant to apply for the same amount of money and we'll be able to con uh, add three more tiny homes. And uh, I've already been in discussions with the administrators of, uh, sorry, the government officials. The island of Guam is uh, gonna be leasing a 102 acre property from the US Navy to build a hospital. The government initially only wanted 52 acres and what we're eyeing is to get at least four to five acres to build this veterans community project with a fellow veteran out in Kansas. Spoke with him, they've been in existence for about five years. Uh, they've put these tiny home, um, well, let's go to the next slide. I believe I have a photo. Um, next slide, please. Yep, here. So this Veterans Community Project, uh, you see the photo right there. This is the project, I believe, in Kansas, where they built um, 49 tiny homes for veterans, and it's meant to assist them get back on their feet. Each of these tiny homes is designed uh, with um, psychological uh, design so that windows are only on one side. The bed is towards the rear of the hooch, the, the tiny home. Um, and what happens is as these veterans migrate out of the temporary shelters, these tiny homes into more permanent housing, everything that's not bolted down to the tiny house, it goes with them. It's familiarity, it's con continuity. They take their beds, the microwave, the tiny fridge, uh, whatever it may be. And so we wanna replicate that here. And so we've verbally put in a request already with the administration once they get that large uh, piece of land, if we could uh, get four to five acres to number one, build this project, uh, number two, we also have spoken with the Guam Trades Academy uh, to set up a small school. Um, and that school will be filled with equipment to teach veterans some kind of skill or a trade, carpentry, um, HVAC, and so on and so forth. Next slide, please. So GY671 is identi was identified with the Together with Veterans uh, Organization, the Steering Committee, to be the lead partner on the ground, basically the boots on the ground, uh, to get this initiative up and running. Uh, we've had since then had three meetings with the public and the general and, and the veterans in general. And the way my, my, my imp impression of the whole thing is the VA saying, Hey, look, you know, who better to speak to and, and lead things in uh, veteran organizations that are on the ground that know their community uh, to lead and, and help reduce suicide, help, um, bring more awareness to uh, of PTSD out into the, the public. And both um, Matt and Amy talked about pride being, and, and you know, it's without saying it, you know, I, I 
did some research and, and pride has a lot to do with our cultural um, identities. Uh, going on with that, you know, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a little bit. The TWV program, the initiative here basically is veteran driven. Um, the collaboration part there is bringing a lot of the community agencies and organizations into the same room. There are very similar uh, goals and missions that the Guam Behavioral Health and Wellness Center has, um, uh, the VA, the CBOC, they, we all have similar goals to help reduce suicide and things like that, but we're not talking to each other. And that's what TWV is, is allowing us to do. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and again, so these are just some of the tenets, the strategies that we're trying to work with uh, the community. Uh, there are many veterans that serve with the Guam Police Department, and one of the ideas is to provide these police officers or first responders with Under Armour shirts that has a uh, big word veteran printed right across the front. So when engaging a veteran that could be, you know, that is, is seen as being irate or whatever it may be, uh, we're going to be working with the Guam Police Department in a situation where they could possibly remove their outer shirt to expose their undershirt that says, hey, this person is a veteran. We've seen some video evidence of just having that commonality between a veteran who is going through a very tough time and a police officer. Uh, if it's an extra added layer to reduce and, uh, you know, to reduce the threat or to, to diffuse the situation, we're willing to try anything and everything. So though, that's just some of the things. The Guam Behavioral Health, we're working with them to create a hotline where um, trained veterans can talk to veterans that are willing to speak. Uh, and, and so again, these are just some of the strategies that we, we were focusing on uh, to try to make sure that the community is, is number one, uh, made aware, and number two, is understanding uh, of some of the situations that we might be going through. Next slide, please. I've identified some of these uh, community partners, Guam Veterans Affairs Office, the Guam Vet Center, um, our police department, the fire department, the office of the governor, they're heavily involved as well, public health, the CBOC. I talked about the silos on the island. And so the TWV program allows us to, to tailor the message so that it matches our community in a cultural sense. Um, Guam, if you've ever been out here, is a huge melting pot. We are like a great landing point for many people. I mean, geez, Magellan did this 500 years ago, saying, hey, this looks like a cool place. Let me just pull over and get some food and, and, and some water and all that good stuff. So we tailor, tailor the message to our community and everything is updated so that everybody knows who we are, what we're doing, and what we're trying to accomplish. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you've heard me talk about some of the challenges being weighed out here. Um, it's not uncommon for veterans to be flown to Hawaii, and I've experienced this myself, where I've sat in there for a five or ten minute uh, appointment. And so you can imagine the total number of hundreds of thousands of dollars it costs to spend to send veterans out to Hawaii to receive treatment. In many cases, I can understand it if it's for specialist care, cardiac care, things like that, but flying out there to get a chest x-ray and then told, hey, your lungs look good. Okay, you can go back home. It's an unnecessary expenditure that I believe that that funding could be uh, provided to the island of Guam itself, build us our little hospital, let a lot of the specialists, you know, come into the island. There, there's things, you know, viewpoints that I wish just, it, it just makes so much more sense. Um, we just need to make sure we identify the, the right tree to bark at and uh, I've side messaged Matt, it's like, hey, look, man, we've got to stay in touch. You're, you're successful with, uh, with getting a lot of the recognition for um, his, you know, his grandfather and, and Asian American. I think we need to do that for some of the people out here on the island of Guam as well. Um, I've talked about the key partnerships that are going to be very important for us to be successful. Uh, as long as we keep things veteran driven, we will continue to update uh, to you know, provide information to the public. And the idea is also, again, to try to get Guam-based uh, regional claims processing out here. Everything, every time we submit an application for um, benefits for disability claims, it ends up on somebody's desk, I believe, in Hawaii. And those have to be processed with the claims coming from the islands of Hawaii as well. 
what will benefit the more than 25, almost 30,000 plus veterans that are out here is a hospital. Long-term care, inpatient treatments, those will be great. Uh, one of the big goals with our Together with Veterans program is, is identifying to the Department of Veterans Affairs, not just in Hawaii, but all the way up to D.C., letting them know, hey, look, there's no inpatient treatment centers. Um, once they're at the Guam Behavioral Health, which is almost always at capacity, if there's no space for them, the veterans are probably just treated for an overnight and then released on their own recognizance. Um, Finally, of course, a veterans one-stop center will be great. Um, it was brought up in our veterans commission meeting that uh, veterans still have a little bit of a confusion as to where to go and what to do. And hopefully with our group GY671, uh, there's a couple of grant uh, notice, uh, grant opportunities that are out there. And that's what we intend to do is, is have an, uh, a, a center, build our uh, veterans one-stop center in the middle of the island. Um, we'll probably try to get the biggest sign we could possibly find. So this way, any veterans coming to the island that are not familiar, they know, hey, go to that building. There's a old Huey helicopter on the top of the building. We'll put some type of a landmark out there so that makes it think, you know, make things uh, nice and easy to, uh, to find. Um, guys, you know, thank you very much for listening. There's a whole lot more, but I believe I've hit my 15 minutes. Um, if you have any questions or comments, chat, I believe we'll open it up in the, uh, later on for Q&A. Um, and yeah, Chantel, go ahead and go to the next slide because if you're from the islands, uh, Native Hawaiians and people from Guam, you'll understand exactly what the next slide is. Center bottom, if you don't know what that is, just ask. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah, this was just me in, uh, this was me and some guys from Hawaii, Saipan. Um, there was even a gentleman who was from Puerto Rico. Um, we got together um, on one Sunday, I put the Guam flag on uh, the caminet poles and ran it up, ran it up about 30 feet high in the air. And slowly but surely, um, people from the island started putting their little post-its on the outside of my hooch. And they put their tactical phone numbers in there, got a hold of them. And I was like, hey, you know, coming over, I'd love to meet you guys, yada, yada, yada. And the picture on the top left there is me. Uh, I built a deck on the back of my hooch with... Uh, if you were in the Air Force, those are actual Air Force pallets made out of, I believe, mahogany or something like that. They're not the metal ones that you're used to. These are the old wooden ones. And on Sundays, the boys would come over. We would just sit down, talk story, and uh, share. You know, just sit down and, and share. Um, the center and bottom picture, I was preparing to make Masubi in Ramadi. <laughs> so awesome. And and that's my, my buddy Randy on the top right there with his... Uh, ukulele entertaining us out in Hawaii whenever we had some downtime. Everybody, thank you very much. Uh, looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you very much, Roy. Yeah, definitely so much information, so many things to think about. Um, this is going to be even helping me in the future as we're um, going to be doing some continued work with Guam. Um, and I also will mention, so we've had some discussions and you mentioned how Another reason you started your nonprofit was it seemed like there were no veteran organizations that didn't center around alcohol on Guam. And so I remember when you sent me all the pictures I was investigating. Um, and sure enough, um, you didn't have anything in there. So that was good. Um, but I'm just, I'm, it's great to know that there's somebody really thinking about the mental health piece on the island and making sure that people could have fun without having to have that focus around alcohol, which I noticed was a strong factor there. Um, thank you for your presentation. Awesome, thank you. And then we'll move on to Rain. Perfect. Thank you, Chantel, um, for the generous introduction earlier. Um, similar to Matt, I am not a SME, but just a passionate advocate and member of the community. Um, I'd like to thank SAMHSA for putting this on. Chantel, Stacy, Dwayne, your team behind the scenes. What a great event. I really enjoyed listening to everybody's stories, um, listening to the hard truths that are being brought to light of what we as minority people endure or have endured. And um, very similar to what Roy said, you know, this is not us complaining. It's just us bringing to light of what is. Um, 
Yep, the views I have are my opinions and is not a representation of the state of Hawaii or the VA. This is just what I am seeing and endure enduring as a community advocate. So next slide, please. So aloha from Hawaii. We move from Guam back over the international date line. So we're, I guess we're going back in time and uh, going to Hawaii. So aloha. Um, next slide. So my name is Ren Kaupiko, uh, Native Hawaiian, uh, many other ethnicities um, that I have as well. That's just one of them. Uh, I'm a Naval Academy grad, service warfare officer, Navy veteran. Um, went back several times, used my uh, GI Bill, got some education. And uh, on the right-hand side are the two vessels I served on as, surf as a surface warfare. And interesting enough, um, my first vessel, the USS Wasp, if we were to go back in the USS Wasp history to the very first USS Wasp, because this is a third ship to bear the name, the very first one had the very first Native Hawaiian to have participated in an American conflict in the War of 1812. Um, it was Prince Ume Ume, and uh, it's very neat to see that link in our histories uh, together. Uh, next slide, please. So a part, a big part of um, this is understanding the cultures of the people and understanding what, what these cultures, how they view things and how they interact inside of together. So like the native Hawaiian culture, we come from a warrior culture um, with very warrior values of strength, um, st things of that nature. Um, so th th those in the culture, like even to this day, um, in the more native rural Hawaiian communities, uh, values of strength and fighting are still very highly um, seen and um, just valued. So uh, this picture shows a uh, native Hawaiian warrior pre um, pre-contact and on the right is uh, another native Hawaiian warrior who is a SEAL operator uh, or who was a SEAL operator today. Um, next slide. So what we have seen is for all of us that have presented, we all have to be somewhat of a historian to better understand of where we've come from to where we are. So for this, like I said, uh, Hawaii's arrival, we, the Native Hawaiian people came to Hawaii, 300 AD, settled. We had our first European contact in 1798, introduced to gunpowder. And one of the uh, gentlemen that were there at the contact recognized the importance of gunpowder, went on, took that to his advantage, and was able to unify all the islands um, with the help of uh, foreigners um, by 1810. So it's very interesting to see the parallels of Hawaii's history and American history. So shortly thereafter was the uh, War of 1812. Um, next slide. So to recognize um, where my people are at, the Native Hawaiians, looking at a just a general population graph. So currently we are coming back up to 300,000 people in my community and majority of them are mixed race. Very rare will we find a full Native Hawaiian. Very rare will we find a half Native Hawaiian. Um, so at 300,000, that is something uh, just to keep in mind of what I am dealing with amongst my community. Um, next slide. So moving forward to Native Hawaiian veterans. Um, I wanted to talk about what current veterans are facing today and uh, what we have endured. And, you know, um, going back to the whole reason the VA was founded, it was founded because of the Civil War veterans and taking care of them. We had a over 100 documented Native Hawaiians that participated in the Civil War. Um, that was 100 years before we became a state. Um, 
it was very interesting to see our link to that. And we fought on both sides of the Civil War. It's not like we took one side specifically. Um, next slide. So in the state of Hawaii, our veteran population is 100,000, 112,000 with uh, an additional 42,000 active duty members in the islands and 9,400 National Guard members. We are a state of 1.42 million people. So a little over somewhere around 15, 16% is represented as a veteran within this state. Um, I cannot give you the specific Native Hawaiian veteran number because we are lumped into the AA and HPI count. And that is one thing I am advocating for us to pull that number out so we can better identify who we are, where we are. And that would be something um, that would need to be done on the census. Um, so something I'm currently working on with our congressional staffs. Next slide, please. So going through this, there's uh, two ways that I look at um, the problems that are endured. We have barriers and we also have like just general issues Native, uh, veteran issues. So barriers that we're enduring right now um, as a group. So like I said, the recognition portion, not knowing who our people are and where they are, that that needs to be brought up as well as recognition from another standpoint. Um, the Native Hawaiian group is not recognized as an indigenous tribe. Um, so we are not recognized by the Department of Interior. So we do not get access to the um, uh, Native American healthcare system. Um, so it, it puts us in a very weird place of how we operate as a group of people. And this has to come from within our, our community for us to gain recognition and is a point of contention. Um, because going back to the history of Hawaii, it's very convoluted, very difficult, but we, how do you say this? After the overthrow, um, the steps that were put into place for us to be a formal state necessarily weren't taken. And uh, Congress speak to this in the early 1900s, um, but it, it left us in a very weird place of how it was handled. Um, if you want to learn more, I can definitely, during questions and answers, we can talk about this or talk offline of where to gain this information um, and better educate yourself on this. Moving forward, uh, accountability of veteran population. Um, actually, so that I mentioned that, pardon me. Um, the next biggest barrier that is endured, and this is something everywhere is benefit awareness outreach, making um, veterans aware of their benefits, as well as knowing those points of where to find them. Um, Hawaii is a rural place. Um, Oahu, our most uh, populated island, is 63% rural. Every other outer island is 94 to 97% rural. So going out and finding these people, like gaining this data is so difficult. Um, as we have seen with veterans, the older veterans, a lot of them that did come home and did go out to the VA or reach out to the VA previously had uh, very negative experiences. And uh, in the community, there's a, a, a massive lack of trust with the VA. And that's something that needs to be rehabilitated because um, right now there's a lot of disenfranchisement amongst the community and a lot of veterans just look at dealing with the VA as a waste of time, uh, definitely for the older generation. Um, so it's winning them over. And um, I've employed strategies to help gain buy-in through uh, speaking to their children, speaking to their spouses, um, of bringing them back to the VA and uh, looking for those entitlements that they rightfully deserve. And I've been very successful in using those strategies um, just 
it's, it's a very hard thing um, dealing with people that just have no trust. Um, as I mentioned, rural Hawaii, rural Hawaii, there's a lot of places that don't have internet, that don't have TV, that survive off of water catchment and might not have electricity. So finding these people is very difficult as well as some of these veterans who have mental health problems, they know how to live in the wilderness. And I, I know of pockets of them that do live in the wilderness and survive um, off the land. And every so often they might come into town to resupply up and then they're back out into the wilderness. So it's, it's a community thing to, to find those gentlemen but they are out there and do exist. I, I used to have a gentleman that worked for me. Um, and with the uh, CBA of his union, he was able to go a year out a year. He could miss a year of coming to work and still be a member. So every three years, he would disappear for a substantial amount of time, just go into the wilderness, find peace with himself and come back. Um, so it's, it's, it's a problem that does exist. Um, access to services, that was a big thing um, that we just heard from Roy. Guam, they have to fly here to Hawaii. The Our Islands in Hawaii have to fly here to Oahu. Um, inpatient, there's only one inpatient clinic that services. And even that, at that, depending on the specialty treatment you need, you might need to fly to the mainland. So these are just uh, barriers that are real. Um, next slide, please. So speaking to that, so Oahu, the island with the red dot, that is the current hospital, VA hospital. Um, the blue dots represent the uh, VA outpatient clinics, but most of them only provide partial treatment. They, they're, not, they're not meant to take on large issues or, or have special specialists. Um, and this is a problem. The island of Molokai just had their outpatient clinic, the um, service provider closed. So there was a, a time here where we were working with groups on island of trying to figure out and make sure that there was no drop on service provided um, to our veterans in those areas. Um, Specifically, that island has per capita one of the higher Native Hawaiian populations. So that was, um, uh, for the Native Hawaiian community, a, a very big deal. Um, luckily, they were able to figure out and have another healthcare provider step up and fill the gap. But there was a lot of questions on how the transition would happen and would it be smooth. And um, yeah, back to Roy's point of, of service providers. Uh, the VA specifically, having turnover. That is a major thing here. Um, one of the directors that manages operations, he's leaving. He just got here like three years ago and he's doing a great job. Um, it's great to see him professionally elevate his career, but it hurts us as people who have finally worked it out so that he has that cultural understanding. He has the, the knowledge of how things work. Because when you move to a new post, whether you're a doctor or somebody in in the um, the VA, like coming to Hawaii is a very unique place, just as any other place around the nation. So, like learning those little things of how things work, who to go to, who are the community people to talk to, um, it takes time. So, um, and as well as earning the trust. Those are time investments. Uh, next slide, please. So Native Hawaiian veteran issues that we endure. Housing, homelessness, that is a very big issue. Um, our state does do a point in time count. And I believe at the last point in time count in 2020, we had 6,000 homeless. 500 of that were veterans. And those are the people they can find. In the, the rural areas, as I mentioned, there are people that are near impossible to count. 
Um, but it has been getting better with the uh, services provided. I have been working with our local um, VA homeless um, department and th they do a great job. Um, we have on this island alone, we have one outpost um, where they are working with uh, US vets and it is a very successful program. They have just contracted out another program in uh, one of the more rural areas on Oahu um, to provide more services, um, more beds for veterans. Um, and that just happens to be in an area that is predominantly native. Um, I guess the concerns are the outer islands of them getting very similar opportunities to provide those services, which right now really don't exist to a standard that um, I guess it should be at, um, as well as the culturally, we are people that um, don't like taking, like, I was speaking to one of the uh, outer island um, VA homeless reps, and she was telling me that culturally there, there's a problem with the community where a lot of the Native Hawaiian um, members don't want to take don't want to take too much. They want others that are in worse situations than them to have the opportunity. Um, so she has a real hard problem of those that do come to her getting their buy-in to get into these programs, not for a sense that they don't need it. It's for a sense that they're, they want people worse off than them to take, to receive it. So she, she uh, did explain that um, that is her barrier that she's working with um, as well as a cultural, another cultural barrier. Um, we come from the village mentality. Um, we have this thing called Ohana, Ohana laws, Ohana housing laws, where you can add on additions in our communities because usually um, you live multi-general households in Hawaii. And um, with that, we have these multi-general households that are providing housing for their family members who are living on the couches or living in sleeping wherever. And technically, like, if you look at the uh, HUD definition, like it does fall into like a category of homelessness. If you're bouncing from house to house on a couch, that is technically homeless. Um, and it's bringing to light these definitions to the community members so that these guys can fall into applicable categories um, so they can get the federal help that they need. Healthcare, we talked about the difficulties in general, um, just getting these guys in to apply for healthcare, as well as the healthcare being on outer islands and having to fly if there's a major issue, um, just all issues. Uh, mental health, uh, that is a big, big part of what we see in our veteran population um, now, as well as our older veterans um, from Korea and uh, Vietnam. Um, and something interesting that I recently learned from a fellow vet. So on the outer islands, there's not many places for these veterans to uh, do peer to peer or together counseling. And um, he's a OEF veteran. And he went in to one of these places and uh, his reception from the older veterans wasn't very pleasant. And that's just the veteran cultural thing that we need to address because uh, they were very hard on him because they see all these accesses and the reception that these younger veterans have. And they didn't have the same luxuries that they received when they discharged. And um, that's something that we need to break that mentality um, internally or work on. Um, next slide, please. Um, something I've been working on, um, the, there's this thing called the Native American Direct Loan Program. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's like the VA loan for tribal land. Um, in Hawaii, 
there are currently 192 um, open leases through this program. And this is extremely successful and extremely helpful for Hawaii. So part of this is it has to be on um, tribal land to go through this program. Um, so America Samoa has 159. So between Hawaii and America Samoa, we hold nearly like 80% of all loans through this program. Um, and I've been working with the uh, federal VA on removing barriers for veterans to access this. Um, having spoken to a lot of native veterans um, in this process, there are several items along the way that just didn't make sense or could be better. And the VA has been very receptive of the criticism that they received. And um, since our meeting in January, I was just reported to the other day that those criticisms were taken and they they helped remove some of those barriers of access. Um, this is very important because we have 28,000 Native Hawaiians waiting for housing. And this is a program that really can offer the opportunity to those um, for financing. Um, and as we see, it is very well used. Uh, next slide, please. So pathways forward. So being, being involved on the field of the field front of this, um, I noticed that we do not have a, a Native Hawaiian Veteran Service Organization stood up. That's something that we need to have, um, and I think that would tremendously help our community because that that organization can provide community outreach. It can raise vet veteran benefit awareness. Um, so as stated earlier, I, I do write in a native publication and I write about just things in the veteran community, um, like how if you have a 0% rating, you can get your ID card. Just passing this knowledge, because a lot of these veterans do not participate in other veteran organizations for them to gain this knowledge. A lot of this is um, passed from peer to peer. And uh, if you're not in any circle that allows you to hear it, like you're not gonna know. Um, as well as this VSO can help with assistance for benefit application. All of us that have worked with the VA do know the difficulties of the administrative portion of applying for things, anything, whether it's a benefit or healthcare. Um, it, is, it is an arduous process. Um, and help there would be greatly needed and uh, would greatly, tremendously help move forward um, these uh, benefit needs. Next slide, please. Um, additional pathways forward would be uh, working with our congressional delegations, um, building better relationships, um, getting monies allotted um, for certain things. Uh, there are programs, um, coming back to mental health, there are mental health programs here um, where there are uh, rehabilitation through hunter-gatherer types of um, instances where veterans will get together. Um, there's a veteran group on the other side of the island that does it through farming. Um, they have a camp and pretty much you're enrolled in their program and you stay there for rehabilitation um, for months on end. And they'll teach you how to live off the land. They'll teach you um, other practices, cultural practices of uh, weaving, of um, things of that nature, how just bringing you back to your roots and um, through the work, you're there with other veterans. And while you're working, you're sharing your stories, uh, hearing each other's problems, and then just uh, having somebody else to lean on. So it's a peer-to-peer -peer type. Um, we do have other peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, to help programs that were set up um, through the community. One of them was called Aunties and Uncles, um, where other veterans who participated in conflict um, would volunteer 
um, pretty much to be a lending ear for those um, that are going through problems. Um, usually they would be within the area that you live and somebody that you could meet with physically and talk to. That was very successful. That program. Um, we also do have a couple other programs I'm very, I'm, I'm aware of um, that are grassroots within the community um, as well as another pathway for uh, forward would be similar interest clubs, getting these veterans to participate in biking groups and um, what, whatever interests there are, because there are many of those that exist in the state. Um, but I found it very interesting. We only have four or five VSOs that are recognized within the state. Um, yeah, uh, next slide. Uh, thank you guys for your time. These are pictures of the only two Native Hawaiians to ever receive the Medal of Honor. Um, and that's another item that I'm working on is uh, bringing recognition to those of who have, who have presented valiant deeds and uh, upgrading those to where they should be. Because um, we've been in con American conflict for 200 years and there's only two that have been valiant. I, I find that very hard to believe. Um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rain. Thank you for that presentation. Um, we are seven minutes over. So if you have questions, please put them in the chat and I will be sending them out to our presenters and so we can get some answers for you. Um, please stay on though, because there is an announcement and Stacey's going to be sharing on that. So I don't want you to miss out on this. Um, but thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. I feel like we've learned, I know I've learned a lot and I feel like everybody here has definitely learned at least one thing today. I've learned a ton of things. Um, I just, I feel like that when it comes to the AANHPI veteran population, there's so much that is unknown to a lot of people. So I really appreciate you taking the time to share your story um, and to help inform us on all the things that are you know, going on um, in those different populations as well. So thank you. And uh, next slide, please. All right, and Stacy. Thanks so much. Um, I just echo Chantel's sentiments that today has been a treat. Uh, we appreciate all four of you for sharing, uh, you know, both history and also sharing of yourselves. So thank you. Um, and, and Chantel, that was a great teaser for this announcement. <laughs> Those of you who are on the SAMHSA listserv have seen this, but just wanted to uh, highlight that uh, during this month, SAMHSA and HHS have announced a funding opportunity for a new Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander Behavioral Health Center of Excellence. This will fall under SAMHSA's Office of Behavioral Health Equity uh, with a goal of increasing cultural competence and reducing behavioral health-related disparities um, experienced in the community. So just wanted to make sure that everyone is aware of this. I think that Dwayne just dropped the um, information in the chat for the notice of funding opportunity. And um, we can go to the next slide. And just wanted to go through a couple of other resources on the topic of the Office of Behavioral Health Equity. SAMHSA does have a specific AANHPI uh, webpage, which has some uh, culturally specific resources. And uh, SAMHSA's Service Members, Veterans and Their Families Technical Assistance Center also has a special populations page where we have resources that are uh, specific to veterans um, from the community. Next slide, please. I also wanted to share some resources from the VA, um, from their uh, Rocky Mountain MIREC, which is their, their research center. Uh, there's some specific information there for you as well. And I think that might be it. Yes, and as always, um, the SMVFTA Center is here for questions. We really appreciate uh, your time this afternoon. Appreciate you giving us a few extra minutes on the back end as well. Um, much appreciation to our presenters and everyone who has attended. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone.